Hi. What is on my workbench today is an RSRF dual band MIMO panel antenna for cellular signal boosters, hotspots, and routers. It was sent in to me from a company called Waveform, and they wanted me to do a teardown and take a closer look inside. For those who are interested in this antenna, I will leave a link to the product page in the video description below. The antenna itself is made by RSRF. It is a dual-band antenna covering the frequency ranges between 600 and 900 MHz and between 1710 and 2700 MHz. That pretty much covers all the signal bands used for 3G, 4G, LTE, and low-band 5G. It can be used with mid-band 5G as well, although the mid-5G band stretches between 2.5 GHz up to 3.7 GHz, so this antenna only covers a small portion of the mid-band 5G range. What you will notice when you first look at this antenna is that it has two of these input and connectors. This is because this is a MIMO antenna. In this case, it has two sets of antennas inside. Now, the reason you wanted to use multiple antennas in a communication system is to achieve some kind of signal diversity. In the MIMO antenna case, it exploits the spatial diversity. Signal diversity is very important, especially in cellular communication applications. One benefit of diversity is to combat multipath fading. Another benefit is to increase the throughput of the channel. Higher throughput means higher data rate, which translates into faster download and upload speed. An additional benefit of diversity is the increased SNR, or signal-to-noise ratio. For those who are familiar with the Shannon theorem, you know that SNR and channel bandwidth both contribute positively to the overall channel capacity. Obviously, MIMO and digital communication in general is a rather advanced topic all by itself, and I won't be able to dive too much deeper into it for this video. If you wanted to understand the topic a little deeper, there are many excellent resources on the internet that can help you explore further. Anyway, spatial diversity can be achieved by utilizing multiple antennas separated at multiple wavelength spacing. Now, this is obviously not practical for a small compact antenna unit like this one. So, for dual antenna arrays like this, it is almost always implemented using a pair of orthogonally polarized antennas. And once we open it up, we will see exactly how it is done in this specific antenna design. Keep in mind that this is also a dual band antenna on top of being a MIMO antenna. So we will have to take a look at how it is implemented to support these two vastly different frequency bands. Okay, time to open it up. Wow, look at how beautiful it is. Now we have opened it up, and let's take a closer look at each of the components. First, let's take a look at the antenna themselves, and then we will take a look at how they are fed. The first thing I wanted to point out are these two different structures here. As I mentioned earlier, this is a dual-band antenna, so instead of relying on one antenna to achieve the wider frequency range required, the designer chose to use two different antennas one for each frequency band. And indeed, these antennas are cross-polarized dipole antennas, as I suspected earlier. This makes sense, as this kind of antennas are very compact and are suitable for the overall flat panel design. The larger one is obviously for the lower frequency band. Just to remind you, the lower frequency band covers 600 MHz to 900 MHz, which translates into a quarter wavelength of roughly 12.5 cm to 8.3 cm, which is uh, largely in line with the feature sizes that we see here. And if you take a look, this one is roughly 8 cm wide and roughly 11 cm in diagonal. Of course, there is a lot of calculations behind the exact sizing of these antennas, 
but you get a rough idea. And the smaller antenna is for the higher frequency band, which ranges between roughly 1710 to 2700 megahertz, which corresponds to a quarter wavelength of approximately 4.4 to 2.8 centimeters. So let me zoom it in and we can take a little bit measurement to see how close we are to those numbers we just calculated. So if we take a measurement here and we can see that each side of these antenna is about just slightly shy of three centimeters. And if we measure diagonally is 3.5 centimeters. So that's largely in line with the quarter wavelength we just calculated here. So let me zoom back out and we wanna just put the whole thing in the view again. A standard dipole antenna has rather narrow bandwidth and the wider bandwidth within each frequency band is achieved via these relatively large square loop features on each of these antennas. And these two antennas work together to achieve the overall bandwidth. You also notice that although the basic designs of these two antennas are similar, but there are some differences I wanted to point out. The low frequency antenna, which is the larger one, that is formed by these four metal pieces mounted on top of a stand made of some dielectric material of low RF losses. It could be PTFE, but I'm not certain. What I do know is that the dome is made of uh, ABS, which is relatively low loss material in high frequencies. And if you look closer, there are some protruding rods on these antenna structures here. And I believe these are there to add some inductance to fine tune the bandwidth and frequency response of the antenna. Now, if you take a closer look underneath this larger antenna structure, you will see this uh, piece of metal that is protruding from the ground and is parallel to the overall antenna structure. I'm not exactly sure what that piece of metal is for, but for RF designs, everything you see has a purpose. Nothing is superficial. So if you know what that is used for, please leave a comment below. And for those RF engineers who happen to be watching this channel, please chime in and correct anything I may have stated incorrectly. Now on to the high frequency band antenna, which is a smaller one here. This one is a PCB edged antenna. Now at a gigahertz frequency, the material used is almost certainly not your standard FR4. It is probably some kind of PTFE based PCBs. The choice of PCB material is critical in these high frequency antenna designs as the dielectric substance affects many critical parameters of an antenna, such as the minimal passive intermodulation or MPI. The additional gain of these two antennas is achieved via this metal backplane, which serves as a reflector. Now let's take a closer look at how these antennas are fed. Remember, because this is a MIMO antenna, we essentially have two sets of antennas. And if you follow the feed line, it's probably easier if you take a look at the larger antenna as the feed line is not on the PCB. The feed lines are these two coaxials that go into the vertical structure here. So if you look at this, each one of this feed line goes into one of these diagonally opposing dipoles. So essentially, these two dipole antennas are perpendicular to each other. Hence, they are orthogonally polarized. Now that you understand how the lower frequency band antenna is fed, you will see that similar feeding pattern is also true for the higher frequency band antenna on the left side here. I'm gonna to try to zoom in a little bit more so you can probably see that uh, the two solder points here. So one, this is one of the feed line into the antenna and uh, on the other side is another feed line into the other set of the antenna and two sets again as we've seen in the larger antenna these are orthogonally polarized for these orthogonally polarized antennas there is another critical parameter which is xpd namely the cross polarization discrimination figure although this figure is not specified in the data sheet for this antenna it is usually at about 30 db or greater and generally the higher the xpd the higher the diversity gain. Because for each polarity and that polarization, let's just assume is this direction or this direction, for each polarity, we essentially only have one feed line 
that drives both of these antennas. You will see that we have some filters implemented on the PCB here. Let me zoom it in and to see if we can look at it closer. I adjusted the lighting so you can see, hopefully, a little bit better. Now you will see these features implemented on this PCB. These are filter structures. Now I believe what is happening here is this is a diplexer allowing a single feed line to drive both of these antennas at different frequencies. And because we have two channels and each channel drives two antennas with different polarization, we actually have two diplexers implemented here. And you can see these are almost symmetrical. Lastly, I wanted to show you is the ballon implemented on the vertical PCBs to drive the balanced dipole antenna. Now, it is a little bit difficult to capture the structure on camera because of the lighting, so I will try to take a few still pictures and hopefully they will come out better. One important thing to notice is that the feed line itself is actually not connected to the antenna themselves. So I will show you here. So now I set to continuity mode, as you can see here. And this is the feed line coming in. And you can see that this feed line is connected to this feed line. But the feed line is not connected to any of the antenna elements here. Instead, the feed lines run through these etched PCB traces, which form RF transformers to convert the single-ended input from the coax into the balanced differential signal that drives these dipoles. I would have liked to do some signal analysis on this antenna, but uh, at the moment I do not have a RF isolator in the correct bandwidth needed to sweep this antenna. So I think that's all I'm going to cover in today's video. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up as always, and remember to subscribe and share. I will catch up with you next time.